Thanks for staying with us. It's time now to look at the papers. What are the headlines saying this morning? Our guest is Mr. Tunde Kolawole, a legal practitioner here in Lagos State. Good morning and welcome to the program, Mr. Kolawole. Good morning, my brother. Hope you had a restful night. Yes, I did have a restful night. Uh, well, at least that small that. time that God gave us to forget our sorrows and live in the land of dreams. <laughs> amen, amen. <laughs> okay, so we're beginning today's uh, review of the papers with the Business NG. Uh, the Business NG uh, is, um, we're beginning with uh, um, the story, the small headline here on the top right corner, on, uh, which would be seen on page five, is foreign investors still wary as Cardoso pitches for hot money inflows. And that's this, the first story that I'd like us to begin with this morning. Well, uh, it is not unexpected that the foreign investors leaving our balance sheet will be too fearful to either come into the country to invest or will be too eager to take out whatever investment they have made in this country. But when people have worked very hard for their money, they will not want it to go down the drain. Most of the problems that we have in this country today, whether in the banking sector, whether in the political sector, whether in the agriculture or economic sector, are man-made. We are the architect of our own misfortune. Until the investors begin to see the green light until they begin to see that we are making very serious and genuine efforts to turn things around. And things can really be turned around within the shortest uh, possible uh, space of time. If we are ambitious, if we are desirous, if we are committed. So, I should think the reactions of the foreign investor, investors are reactions that uh, good businessmen will make given the circumstances of the Nigerian situation. Even though I have read somewhere where a southern African businessman was saying that um, the pulling out of businesses out of Nigeria is just going to be for a short while. And sooner than later, international businesses will still return to Nigeria, given the huge market potential of the country, the huge uh, mineral resources and uh, potential of the country, and also the very, very huge manpower capacity of the country. You remember when, uh, is it uh, Naimu by now, what do they call it, uh, was being established? One of the leading investors in there uh, came, I think, from Zimbabwe. I think he is based in South Africa. He said he had never seen what he saw in Nigeria when they were establishing that uh, telecommunication company. That where they call for advert, uh, for vacancy advert, there were people who have two, three PhDs, three master's degrees in diverse areas who were applying for jobs. And Nigeria is about one of the only countries in the world where you can see that kind of a thing. So these are indices. These are things that can really be honest to pull Nigeria out of uh, the quagmire it is now. But I suspect, until you begin to show some seriousness and all that, the red light, the amber light, will continue to uh, uh, be seen in the international business circle. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I don't know if we are just talking out of arrogance and self-confidence that we are a, a populous country and because of that everything will work in our, in our favor. Uh, because people, follow. <laughs> people who are pulling out are the people who are doing legitimate business. For instance, these exactly. illegal miners that we've been hearing about, they're not pulling out. They are still doing what business they are doing. So the min large exactly. mineral resources that we have in Nigeria are being tapped, whether we like it or not. And the people who are tapping it are not contributing to the growth of Nigeria's economy at all. So we're letting the legitimate ones go, and then the illegitimate ones are still continuing as if nothing, nothing is happening. Okay, right now, because of the accusations and everything that they have given uh, Binance, Another headline is saying that Binance uh, departs to depart Nigeria market and services in local currency. Yes, they have told us that Binance is doing illegal things. They are making the Naira to, to fall and so many accusations that they have said. They have all, even said they are financing terrorism and all that. Now they are folding, 
holding up and leaving Nigeria. I was just asking this morning, couldn't there have been a, a middle ground to meet these people, prosecute them if you find them guilty and all that, and make sure that it's not just pack up and get out of our country, because that is what it's a, it has amounted to. They are leaving the country. And whether we accuse them rightly or wrongly, it is sending a signal to the people who may want to come and invest in Nigeria again. That, those are just my thoughts. I don't know what you feel about it. Binance is leaving now. I agree with you totally. You know, when I was doing my intro, I said most of the problems that we have in this country are self-made. We are the architect of our own misfortune. The the, the binance that we are talking about, if there has been a very good regulatory framework on GAM, mm. if there is no conspiracy collusion between the regulatory authorities and then that company, most of the malfeasances that they have committed or allegedly committed and other would not have happened. For every uh, infraction that those companies have, been, they have committed, you will find that 70%, they were aided 70% by, 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 by Nigerian people. People who really should be regulating them, the foreign exchange uh, uh, market. As regards uh, whether there could be uh, sanctions for them, either internationally or locally, I agree. I mean, there are input uh, opportunities for the Nigerian authority to make our sanctions to, to, to these people. Of course, we and I do know that um, there are international uh, finance uh, or business uh, appreciation courts, mm. such as we went during the IPI uh, uh, issues, that Nigeria could take such a company to. Of course, too, those companies are not living in the cloud. They came from one country or the other. They could be reported in the country into their own country where they come from and then uh, legal proceedings uh, commence the case. There is also nothing that stops the Nigerian authorities from arresting the principal officers of the company and then arranging them in the court of competent jurisdiction in Nigeria to face the, 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 the consequences of whatever infractions they may have uh, committed. But the truth of the matter is that uh, we may not have the political will to be able to do that because, like I said, whatever infraction this group may have been committed, they must have been aided and abetted uh, by the Nigerian people, especially those people in the regulatory uh, uh, area and all that. So if your people are the one aiding and abetting this people and all that, they wouldn't be too eager. Or they will not have both the moral justification or the legal justification or the lawful justification to begin to take steps to bring these people to justice as the circumstances of this case um, they may have uh, uh, required. Uh, because like we said, the Amber Light has always been there. There were reports in so many newspapers on radio and then uh, uh, so many uh, uh, platforms that the foreign exchange uh, uh, the market uh, of Nigeria, these are these activities of some of these companies and the central banks of Nigeria, uh, was uh, being done in a very opaque manner. And that, that is what has turned so many people into multi billionaires in the country without really investing or manufacturing any products. So your question is again, there are opportunities to bring them to justice in Nigeria. There are opportunities to bring them to justice in their own country. There are opportunities to bring them to justice in the international business arena. Hmm. If we have the political will. Yeah, because the National Assembly, I know they invited uh, Binance um, head to come. But before that happened, two officials of Binance just landed Nigeria and they were arrested, you know, as we usually do things, arrest them do, uh, before you do investigation and all that. And because of that, uh, the others were afraid to even uh, appear. So maybe there could have been a, a, an explanation. We don't know. But now this is what, where, where it is going, which means a lot of Nigerians will have to lose their jobs and lose uh, their means of livelihood because of this. I, I don't know. But another thing, um, on the headlines here again, on still on uh, Business NG, IMF to federal government, implement cash transfer program before addressing fuel and electricity subsidies. IMF again. <laughs> so I don't know what you feel about that. I have my reservations, but what do you think? Hey, honestly speaking, all these cash transfer regimes or programs are effective in an organized economy where there are data, data especially as the those who are living the poverty, below the poverty line, 
that require to be built, that require to be helped, and what have you. You and I do know that statistics is very, very opaque in Nigeria. And you see what has happened of recent, while um, the Minister of Humanitarian Affairs, and I think that of, um, uh, is it uh, internal uh, affairs, are in trouble. Billions of naira have to be voted to ascertain, to do research, to get data as regards those who should ordinarily be paid out in respect to some of these cash transfer uh, programs. Whereas you and I do know, now before you even begin to think about such program, what you should have done is uh, get the statistics uh, before you even uh, begin to think about the program. And we do have the uh, organs and structures in this country to help us get, get such statistics. Say, for example, the Federal Minister of Statistics, they are all over the country, and they have been there since they're independent. So why such persons are not being to get some of these things for uh, me as an individual, that we have to contact such programs so, 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 to, to private uh, companies? Who don't even have the structure? Who don't have the resources? Who don't have the reach to get us the, the, uh, the, 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 the detailed and then the well-informed practices as they what to be done? Furthermore, if you look around the world, there are very few places where this can, where this can transfer a program has really helped people out of the poverty. I know they've done it in India before. I know they have done it in Pakistan and all that. But rather than elevate the program of the people and all that, you find out that in most of those places, the people are thinking to more and more the object uh, poverty and all that. Because once you transfer this money and all that, rather than invest the money, the people who get the money will just use the money to solve their immediate needs, uh, buy food stuff, cook a pot of stew, uh, maybe pay their children's school fees, so that um, uh, life uh, goes on. These are not people who could uh, waste and invest the money to really begin to turn their lives around and uh, what happens. So we need to be more uh, sensitive to the nature of our environment as regards uh, the way and manner we're going to bail out uh, uh, these people. The IMF program, like I said, works in an organized environment where there are statistics, where people are sensitive, where there are all sorts of safety measures to really be able to help the poor people, the indigent people, the people who are living below the, I mean, below the poverty line in the different countries of the world. We are not in that bracket as a nation. And of course, too, once you begin to do this cash transfer, uh, corruption, political um, uh, decisions will influence it. It is not impossible, and it has been alleged in the past, that um, some politicians use the opportunity to smuggle their supporters, they are, they are, they, those who vote for them, into all these cash transfer um, uh, programs, which at the end of the day does not get to the place where it should even uh, get to. I was also reading the paper not too long ago that uh, some of the people who benefit from some of these things really don't have a bank account. And even if they do have bank accounts, those accounts would have been shut down now because most of them will not have their DVA, mm. most of them will not have their NIN, mm -hmm. because we've been told that the Nigerian uh, data management, the NINC, and then uh, also uh, uh, the banks and other, don't have branches in uh, some of these local governments where DVA and where NIN could be provided for the people so that uh, the cash transfer regime or the money will be transferred to the different accounts and the thing can work uh, seamlessly. I've been told that the capacity of the NIMC to provide NIM for the Nigerian people is as uh, it's still required, but I mean, that more than 100 million people still required to be provided with NIM. Little for the people, I mean, for the BGN and the different banks and other. So it's not too good to begin to listen to the dictates of the IMF. IMF has been responsible for the collapse of government, for the poverty in some different countries, of the, especially in the Latin American countries. So we should be wary of them. And let us also remember what the general judge Mopas just said. He said, and the soldier once said is that Mopas uh, just told him that, look, listen to the IMA when they talk to you, but be wary of implementing their program. I think that is the kind of wisdom that we should apply. And the circumstances are okay. Asking us not to subsidize anything, agriculture, transportation, education, Power and what have you. We are asked in their own country where they come from, in Britain, in America, and all Virtually all these things are subsidized. And asking us not to subsidize those things in the circumstances are okay. We are people are even more poor. We are there are no food stamp for people. He says, uh, to me, it's suicide. He's to me, it's suicide.
we should be wary of the IMF uh, the recommendation in that respect. Yeah, everybody's just getting tired of these uh, external influences. Uh, well, what, what do you expect when we keep going cap in hand to borrow and borrow and borrow? They go, now <laughs> well, tell us. They the say has no choice. if you take care of today, tomorrow will take care of itself. You, you know, the whole problems that we are having now started with the fuel subsidy removal. And they're advising us to give pittance to people. 20,000 Naira will not even buy a bag of Gary right now. You're not talking about rice, which is like exactly. four times of that amount, or even four plus exactly. of that amount. And they're and saying, how well, many people mm. will even get it when it comes to mm. that? I'm thinking about, whenever I, I talk about this thing, I think about the people in my village that I can identify as poor people. They can't even move mm. to the next village, except they're trekking. And then you're asking them, to come with BVN, with NIN, uh -huh. <laughs> people that don't even have, they don't even have any idea exactly. about that. There exactly. was a time in the and time. And the NIMC and the banks and all that will know, are not, don't even have the capacity to provide those things for them now. They so don't have the what, what is so difficult? Because you in the time the of, NIA in the time of. We are talking about, the NIA we are talking about, that program started in 1939, under the Alagi Shehu Shagari presidency. And that is what we are still battling with up till now. From 1979, you know? I don't know. Maybe there's this duplication of offices. I, I don't know. But in the time of uh, Obasanjo, there was this uh, national identity program where every village had officers that were doing this national identity. And everybody was captured, no matter how, how old, how, how poor, how, whatever, because it's in your village. I don't exactly. know why that is not, we cannot bring back know, to such a thing for NIA. remind ourselves, eh, in the past, the National, the Federal Office of Statistics used to have offices in the different local governments all over the country. Apart from other at the state level, in all the different local governments, the Federal Office of Statistics had offices in all those places. And it is for purposes of capturing some of these data that you are talking about. I'm not too sure whether they have retained those offices. And if they are retained, if they have retained them, whether these great resources and funds have been made available to them to be able to carry out some of these very, very crucial and essential functions that the Federal Office of Safety has been started to do. Mm. Well, there's another one. Um, you said that a lot of the things that happen in Nigeria are caused by us. And this story maybe just explains that. And when I read it, it was very, very worrisome to me. The BUA, the Bois Cement, said why we couldn't sustain selling cement for 3,500 Naira. Now, last year, you remember that uh, there was this story that uh, Bois has said they were going to reduce uh, the price of cement back to 3,500 Naira, and everybody was clapping. At some point, we didn't see the 3,500 Naira cement anymore. And Bois is coming out to say that they did implement it, but the middlemen, were the ones who prevented those who needed it to have it at 3,500 Naira. And the shame was shaming me, as we say in Nigeria. I don't even know how to explain this, how to say this. I don't know what you think about it. If a company mm. is true to its words and the middlemen are preventing that largesse, let me call it a largesse now, that they are giving to the people to reach the people, mm. from reaching the people. Mm. Let's... Uh be very, very careful. Why do I say this? The attempt by the federal government to dictate the prices at which cement was going to be sold for me <laughs> is neither here nor there. It's uh, like uh, making a decree under a military regime as regards how prices of goods and services will be sold. You and I will remember all efforts in the past uh, since independence to regulate uh, the prices of goods and services in Nigeria and in most parts of the world have never worked. It had always been those products and services and those who sell them uh, on the ground. It creates a large black market um, uh, uh, platform where goods and services that are regulated uh, are being sold. The truth of the matter is that there is no way any cement company in Nigeria today can keep the price of cement at 3,500 naira. Why do I say this? Even though uh, most of the raw material that they use, like lime and water, so, are gotten in Nigeria. We must remember that they also use electricity. We must remember that they also buy diesel to power their plants and other. We must also remember 
that they have to freight their goods and services, their, their consignments, their cement from different parts of the country to the other. Yes, and then you must also remember there are other overhead costs and what happens. Taxes at the local government level, at the federal level, and then at the state level. When you put all these in place into the production of cement and all that, you and I will know that it is wishful thinking for the federal government and the state government to be dictating for the cement manufacturer that they should be selling their product at 3,500 naira per, 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 per bag. The, the producers who are telling us it is the middlemen who are the cause of their inability to sell at that uh, price are just being economical with the truth. In the first instance, they merely agreed or merely respected the federal government by saying at that period at the time that they are going to be selling at 3,500 naira. They wouldn't want to be seen to be antagonizing the federal government. But they do know that in reality, that is not uh, possible. For us to be able to buy cement at 3,500 naira, if that would ever be possible in the next 10 or 20 years, you would have to look at some of those things that I mentioned. Uh, diesel, which I'm told sold for about 1,100 naira now. And of course, petroleum, and also spare parts for vehicles. And also, you can imagine, imagine how much a tailor head is going to cost now, given the balance, um, I mean, given the differential between the naira and the dollar, between the naira and Pakistan, between the naira and euro. Because you have to import those trucks. Yeah, but Mr. Kula, uh, this, this is not... From different parts of the country. So all yeah. these are entries that the, the people produce. You know? I, I, I understand, I understand what you're the saying. Of their, their, their I understand what you're saying. Yeah. I, I, don't, I totally agree with you that um, it's going to be difficult. How do you dictate to someone how to sell his things when you are not <laughs> exactly. helping him to buy? Mm -hmm. But the thing, the, the, the problem here right now is that even when these people have agreed to do the needful, there are people who are not government that are preventing that from happening. For instance, let me give you a, another example. Okay. Now, you go into the streets. In a lot of places, they're selling a sachet of what we call pure water for 50 naira. And when you go to the companies that are selling this water to them, some of these companies are still selling a bag of 20 of these sachets for 250. The highest I have seen is 300 naira. But they're selling one for 50 naira, that means you're going to have a thousand naira per bag. So mm. yes. it is not you now the right. fault of the people uh, who are supplying the water, right. but the people when who are the middlemen. When the are, are scarce, and when inflation is uh, this much and all that, we should not, uh, I mean, there's no doubt that we'll be seeing some bracket here, here and there, people trying to take advantage and make a, a jumbo profit at the expense of the ordinary consumers uh, on the street. Yeah. Um, those things are not impossible. The, there are things that happen in this coming, uh, given the circumstances that we have in our hands. What, the government can step into some of those areas and make sure that those things are never, uh, they don't happen uh, all the time. But that itself is also going to be very difficult. Why do I say that? I have spoken with some uh, women who said some of those things that I'm talking about. They told me that the reason why they do that is that when they go back to renew their stock, when they want to return their stock after what they are selling is being sold out and other, most times when they go to renew their stock, they don't meet the price. They don't meet the, 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 the cost at which they bought the one they sold, who may have most times have become a different uh, uh, by the time they go to return their stock. So in order to be able to return their stock, they must anticipate that there might be an increase in the wholesale price from where they are buying, put it on it, a kind of speculative uh, uh, thing. And then so that if, uh, and so if um, they get in there and the price from the, the producer has changed and all that, they will not be at a loss. So that is what is uh, happening. The way out of that is to stabilize the Naira and make sure that the uh, raw materials increase in into manufacturing processes uh, are not sold or that people who use them get them at a fairly good uh, a price. Yeah, well, we understand all that, but uh, we'd like to appeal to the people who, like the pure water I was using, anytime you go back to the company, they're still selling you at the same price, so why are you hiking the price? For other things, we all will understand. This cement that we were talking about, they, if the company agreed to be selling at 3.5 mm -hmm. or lower than that so that the people will get it at 3.5, why? So don't you think we should start 
defining or redefining the role of the middleman in our economy because a lot of these problems are coming from the middlemen. It is possible. There is no doubt about that. It is possible. For example, you go to other countries of the world uh, and all that, you find that the goods that you bought some 10 years ago, by the time you go back to that country after 10 years and all that, the price might still remain the same without any significant changes or change mm -hmm. in the price of those goods and services that you bought some 10 years ago. That is possible when the currency of a country is very, very stable. That is possible. Furthermore, that is possible where there are statistics uh, of, as regards uh, how you can manage or regulate the economy. But the challenges that we have in our circumstances is that uh, the statistics are never there, our currencies are never stable. And more importantly, you must remember that even though there is moral, I mean, businessmen should incorporate morals and incorporate morals into their business. Uh, too many times, business is not about morality. It's about uh, making a profit. And most times, it is in crisis situation that some people who ordinarily become a millionaire. That is why you find out in what situation where you and I will not be too eager to be dealing in arms and ammunition and weaponry. Some other persons will take advantage and begin to deal in arms and ammunition not minding what their beliefs are, not minding what their religions are, not minding the consequences of their actions and what are they. Uh, uh, so, morality and businesses, even though it's good, they could um, be helpful. Most times, businessmen think about uh, profit uh, more than morals and ethics when they are doing their businesses. So long as they do not fall foul of the law, they want to continue doing their businesses the way they used to do it. Oh, well, <clears throat> falling foul of the law, we'll have to talk about that another time because we don't know. Oh, okay, let's move on to Nature News. Nature News is uh, next. Um, so, okay, we still have this uh, story. We honored uh, 3,500 promise per bag of cement, says Boa. Now, um, food crisis, Don bags food importation. Um, I don't know what you think. Is, re is food importation really a solution, especially in the long run, to Nigeria's uh, food crisis? Honestly, we, we've been, among some circle of friends, we have been having this debate as regards to whether the government will require to import food or teach the people to plant uh, whatever food item they require and then be able to fish for themselves and all that. But the truth of the matter is that uh, a man who is facing starvation, uh, asking or telling such a person uh, to make himself available for, to be taught how to plant uh, grains, how to plant a uh, legume, how to fish for himself or be able to feed himself and all that, may not be too helpful because by the time in the process of teaching him and in the process of him going and the process of him adversing, Whatever he's been taught to do, he probably would have died uh, before, before those things uh, uh, yield some good uh, results. So, the analogy I'm making is that uh, at, with the crisis we have in our hand now, in which uh, vehicles carrying uh, items, food items from different parts of the country to other, are being attacked and the food items being looted, given the circumstances in which we are houses, we are state government, we are federal government, we are the state government have uh, kept some food items emergency use are not having and, 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 and looted. We may require, in my humble opinion, the federal government may require to import uh, uh, some food items to crash the prices of uh, the food items in the market today and then to make this food item uh, immediately available to the people. Uh, then you will teach them how to plan what they will eat, given the level of insecurity in the rural areas, the, the hunger and starvation that is taking place in the country today, where people are beginning to sell their children to be able to eat and all that. Uh, the, the situation is uh, very, very dire. I would, in my humble opinion, advise and recommend for a short time, maybe for a period of six months, uh, import a food item into the country, make it available to the people, distribute them at uh, very cheap prices, to be able to make the items available and then crash the prices of the existing uh, food items in the market, and also use that period to go back to the land and begin to plant um, uh, food or agricultural products in a very, very massive uh, manner. Because 
as of today that we say we are not going to be importing the food, but we still have, don't have access to the farmland. We are still not importing machinery, um, um, high yielding uh, uh, seeds and all that. We, we cannot go back to the farm. So uh, how would we solve the problem if we are not going to import? Importation to me, maybe the, the, the thing to do today, import fish, import chicken, import egg, and also import uh, grains, legumes, and water, at least for a period of six months, so that they're able to dash, dash them down the tension and stop people from looting the different warehouses and then the trucks that are flying the country mm. while carrying the food items. Yeah, because um, it, it, that's really important. Uh, I don't know, agriculture, agri extension officers disappeared from our farms, from our villages. I don't know why. We don't have mechanized farming because uh, at some point the local governments were having tractors and other things, farming pits that people could use. Uh, and we don't see those things anymore in Nigeria. We don't see dry season farming that much because irrigation farming okay. is not, is not mm. that much in the south. At least I don't know about the north, but in the south we don't find them. These are things that we need. And if we get this, instead of even opening the borders, we can start importing or exporting, exporting food items. But like you said, a period of six months will not kill us. Exactly. Look, I, I, I take your analogy from where you stop. Look at a country like uh, Ukraine. That country has been at war now for about two years. Mm. Do you know as intense as the war is, they are still exporting wheat and some other grains. And they water. even gave us some grains. The, most of the arms and ammunition that they are using now, especially some of the long-range missiles that they are using, they are not beginning to produce those things in their own country. They are also producing drones and some other armaments in their country. And that is to say that despite the war that is taking place in some of those countries and all that, they still haven't neglected research uh, and development. They still, have been, they still have been able to find a way around the agricultural uh, production activities and all that, so that their people are not uh, starving. I mean, a war that has lasted two years, and we are not hearing about any story of starvation or hunger in a country like uh, Spain. I think for me that is food for thought as the uh, as people. But we in Nigeria, we have been at war with Boko Haram. We have been at war with bandits and with kidnappers uh, for about 15 years now, or if not 20 years, or there about. And because of that, we have abandoned the farm now. We have abandoned the rural area. We have not been able to secure them. We have not been able to protect uh, uh, the farmer. Uh, that is a lot of uh, danger in the horizon. As regards the rural areas, we talk about agricultural the officers, the extension, I mean, outreach program that used to take place in the distance and all that. Well, immediately we begin to sell uh, a petrol and making huge money for meat and all that. We abandon the farmland and people also abandon the rural I, I think we've lost um, the audio uh, from uh, Tunde Kolawole. We're hoping he could rejoin us a little bit uh, in a moment, because we still have some time on our hands uh, before we end this paper review. In the meantime, I'll just take uh, some of the headlines that we have not touched, hoping that if he returns, we are going to continue uh, with it. On the Punch newspaper, we have um, uh, Nigeria's electricity fuel subsidies may gulp 7 trillion naira. That's according to IMF. We've dealt with IMF, and we may not go back to that again. Army chief dismisses coup calls, demands good leadership. Okay, that's on the Punch newspaper. We also have federal government food smuggling. Federal government intercepts 141 green trucks. Drivers threaten strike over attacks. The riders there are customs seize 120 smuggled green trucks. EFCC intercepts 21. Tinubu orders sale of forfeited food. Now, truck owners threaten... Uh, to stop transporting food over a tax, say no insurance for looted food stuff. Uh, those are some of the headlines there. Okay, uh, Mr. Kolewole has rejoined us. Mr. Kolewole, we lost your audio at some point. We're glad to know that you're back. Okay, good. Farming is a very dirty job. I think documentaries which farmers in France and winemakers in France are abandoning the farm. They are, some of them are committing suicide because they think farming is not enough to make and sell meat. Some are selling their farmland and then going to other businesses. Uh, not too long ago, we have also seen farmers in India and Pakistan and Germany 
embarking on a, on a, on a strike and then occupying the city centre because they think families no longer able to guarantee them a, a decent uh, living. The same challenges we are also facing in Nigeria and what are they? These are some of the reasons why farming has collapsed in the rural area where most of the young people who ordinarily should take off farming from their parents have abandoned the farm and migrated to the urban centers to look for blue, for, for blue uh, color, um, uh, jobs in the different centers and on the different uh, city centers. Uh, if we are going to be attracting hands, young hands to farming, we must uh, make the rural areas uh, a livable, electricity in there, pipe bone water, and good network of roads and internet services. Except we do that, we will begin, we will continue to face the kind of challenges that we are having now in the area of um, agricultural production. So it is not just the bandits, it is not just the insecurity, no. Farming all over the world is going to decline. Not many people want to take to farming because it is tedious, it is dirty, it is no longer as lucrative as it used to be. So to turn things around, you must provide incentives for these farmers in form of subsidies and making life comfortable for them wherever they may be or wherever they may be doing their farming. And now it's not just a matter of the farmers not being able to farm. Even the, the, the products that we have, the, um, the drivers are threatening to stop transporting because the food smuggling, federal government intercepts 141 grain trucks, drivers threaten strike over attacks. Uh, now you know that food trucks are being attacked, people are looting the food and all that. It's, everything is connected. And exactly. unfortunately, the, the Minister of Agriculture came out and said that what happened in Abuja, for instance, is not hunger, it's, it's criminality oh. and all that. Yes, a oh. lot of people, me inclusive, we will not say people should loot uh, other people's properties, no matter what it is, people should not steal and all that. But hunger can lead a lot of people to desperation and things like this will happen. Now, if the food, uh, if the truck drivers down their tools and say they are not going to tr uh, transport this food anymore. That is another wahala, as we would like to say it in Nigeria. I don't know. Very, very serious wahala because uh, the whole economy was uh, almost uh, shut down because uh, the, those trucks, uh, the activities have a bandwagon effect on what happens in the other uh, sectors of the Nigerian economy. For example, it is not just food that can be transported, they also when they deliver those food items to wherever they are taking it, they also use the stock to bring down some other things uh, uh, down south. Besides, those stock drivers and all that also buy diesel. So if they are not working, diesel mm -hmm. will not sell. Mm -hmm. They also have motor, motor boys and loaders and what are those. And some of those market women and men children whose life are dependent on the activities of those uh, truck, uh, and truck, uh, truck and truck uh, drivers and all that. So, we must, as much as possible, find a way not to get the truck uh, drivers to really uh, uh, pull out their trucks uh, from the road. Because if they do, the consequences, I mean, the situation in the country today will get uh, worse. And I'm also sorry to say the Minister of Agriculture uh, shouldn't be talking the way he's uh, talking. We should be sensitive to the plight of our people. But very late, hunger should not be a justification or a reason to become a thief, to become a looter, mm. to begin to steal. But then, we must be careful that uh, not all people will be able to uphold their morality, not all people will be able to uphold their ethics, not all people will be able to say, look, in spite of this hunger, I'm not going to do anything that will make me fall power of the law. And because of that, uh, we should not even, in the first instance, push people to begin to fall out of the law, for people to begin to commit crimes, mm -hmm. for them to be able to make ends meet. Say, for example, our young people who are doing, who are, who are chapa, who are fleeing the country, they go by all these rickety boats across the Atlantic Ocean, Indian Ocean, and other, with a view to get into Europe, America, in search of a better life. Do you know when you interview some of these people about the risk they are taking? They will say, look, what is the value of my life? If I remain here without taking a risk to get to Europe, if I remain here with that of hunger and poverty and mosquito and quasoko, why don't even I take the risk of uh, uh, going by rickety uh, boats to Europe? And if in the process I fell in the Atlantic Ocean and the fishes hit me, those fishes will become fatter. And when they become fatter, when some fishermen <laughs> uh, uh, kind of uh, get them and all that, 
They will sell them and then my people must be one of those people who will benefit from eating those fish and then uh, they get to the penis and what have. So these are the kind of fatalities. These are the kind of thinking that you find in the minds of those who go to loot uh, government warehouses, who loot those trucks that are taking food at them from one part of the country to the other. A hungry man is an angry man. Talking ethics, talking religion, talking about belief. So somebody's stomach is empty. Now on Bulo Pino, it's a very, very futile effort. Yeah, I, I saw a story a few weeks ago where robbers entered a house and all they took was a bag of gari, a pot of soup, <laughs> and, <laughs> and so many other things. They left the phones, they left every other valuables, they took the pot of soup, they took the, the rice that was cooked into the, and in, was put in the fridge, and everything that they could find that was food, and left. But these people are classified as thieves, but you will find out that they are thieves for a reason. Uh, stealing exactly. is still bad in any ramification anyway. We, we, we are also seen a situation in uh, some of these areas too, in which uh, people go out, or even when they are cooking their pot of soup or food, before they turn around, some other person has gone to those pot of soup <laughs> that are on fire, uh, food being cooked and all that. They empty the pot and disappear into thin air. And these are some of the reports we also get in some of these uh, places and all that. Mm. So protect what you, you, you have just said. So if a man goes to commit burglary and know that he took a bag of rice and then a pot of soup and then maybe a bottle of water, you can almost guess that the reason why he has gone to do the burglary or to steal and all that is the out of a, a serious hunger and a distress. We shouldn't push our people to that level. Yeah, there's no person even to beg because the person you're begging <laughs> might even turn around to beg you too because the situation exactly. is biting everybody. Now, exactly. 700... And 67 manufacturers shot down in 2023. That's according to Manufacturers Association uh -huh. of Nigeria. That's another story on the punch. Uh -huh. Isn't that a frightening perspective? I mean, isn't that a frightening story, my, my brother? Mm. When 700 uh, companies shot down within one year, we haven't taken cognizance of all those who have shot down uh, before that time. And since the beginning of this 2004, some other forces have shot down. The implications of that is very, very grievous. One, people will lose their jobs, isn't it? One, production activities uh, go with the living of those companies and what have you. One, those who sell raw material and provide services to those companies and others are also out of jobs and what have you. So these are very, very striking specters and what have you. That uh, the local government, the state government, and then the federal government require to sit down with experts. And there are great people, great minds in our universities, in the business communities and others, who could provide solutions to some of these problems. The uh, Jerusalem Compassion also came out, I think, uh, at his 87th birthday ceremony that uh, Zimbabwe had once witnessed the kind of things that we are witnessing now. Mm. That the federal government should go and talk to the Zimbabwean authorities and find out how they were able to manage the situation. Those are the kind of things I would recommend to the federal government as well. But even without looking at Zimbabwe, I am convinced that Nigerians have enough expertise. We have enough men and women uh, who could uh, provide solutions, immediate solutions to some of these problems. But that is going to be possible, but that will only be done if the political class, if the politicians are not that, will also have to tame their greed. They will have to tame their greed. If they don't tame their greed, nobody is going to stick out his neck to come and help them solve the crisis that we have in our hands today. Mm. Okay, let's move to other news. Uh, still in the Punch newspaper, we have Army Chief dismisses cool calls, demands good leadership. You know, there have been this talk about uh, the fact that there may be a coup and there are whispers all around the country and all that. So he, he, he has come out to say that there is nothing like a coup uh, coming up. He has dismissed that and he's calling in the same breath for good leadership. I just like your comment on it. Uh, honestly speaking, when you look at our history as a nation, when you look at our trajectory as a people, you also look around the world and all that. You want to agree with me that a coup d'etat is not a solution to any society or any country's problem, mm -hmm. more especially our own problem. Especially given the circumstances in which we are finding ourselves. Why do I say this? Most times, uh, the military men don't have the expertise to run society the way they should be run. Say, for example, the developmental, the giant strike that Nigeria made in the Second Republic. 
Look at the giant strike that Nigeria made uh, in the Second Republic. Look at also the giant strike that we have made in spite of all the challenges and all that. It's 1999. The politicians, in spite of their deficiencies and all that, they are more proactive. They plan, they strategize. Uh, some will do in the last two years or there about, or since um, uh, fertilized area, with the giving us the two railway line lines now. They have also invested in mass parties in terms of urban uh, buses and what have you. In spite of the fact that the military had more money when they were in power and what have you, they never thought about this program. Imagine when the country had the money under the military. They had laid down the rail tracks. They had done underground the um, uh, transportation system and all that. They have expanded uh, the road network all over the country and all that. They had invested massively in agriculture and then the uh, IG League invested and all that. It wouldn't be in the kind of dilemma that we have in today. So to the extent that the military are not trained to manage the society, they don't have the expertise. Most of their programs are ad hoc. Ad hoc uh, programs, uh, they just... Uh, the design program on a natural basis, and then begin to implement it. So it will be a huge, huge setback for anybody to be thinking or to be encouraging the military to, to, to come back to power in Nigeria today because of the crisis that we have in our country. How can we even say that they are not part and parcel or that they didn't contribute the problem to the problem that we have in our hands today and know that? They cannot totally be escorted or isolated from some of the problems that we have in our hands today. And to the army chief, that is what they will always say. Most times, the army chiefs are not the problem. It is the rank and file. Look at the coups that are taking place in the, in the Sahel region. They are mainly being spearheaded by the middle class uh, officers, the lieutenant colonels, the captains, the lieutenants, and the leaders and what that. In fact, the army generals themselves are sitting on the keg of gunpowder because if it is the rank and file, if it is the middle class officers that carry out the coup and all that, they themselves are not spared the consequences of a uh, of, uh, coup d'etat from uh, the junior officers and whatever. The solution to this problem, in my own opinion, is for us as a nation to make sure that we begin to find immediate solutions to the problem that we have in our hands in terms of unemployment, in terms of hunger, in terms of insecurity and whatever. The officers themselves have benefited immensely from the stable democratic system that we have in the country. Yeah. That led to the senior officers and know that I am sure they will not be dreaming and they will not be praying and they wouldn't want any coup to take place in Nigeria today because they are also beneficiaries of the stable uh, political uh, system and regime that we are. And more importantly too, when they leave the services, some of them have uh, contested as governor, as senators, as House of Reps members, and have aspired and become president. Two of their men have become president within the last um, a few years. So there is no justification whatsoever for any of them to begin to live their life to carry out a coup uh, for whatever, uh, to pander to the dictates or to the pressure that are coming from so selfish and greedy and unconscionable and uh, uh, people who are not uh, thinking too deeply as to get the consequences of what they are promoting. Okay. Uh, let me just say this uh, last one, um, bring this to your attention. Uh, on the Guardian newspaper, there is this small headline, uh, the background is red, <laughs> let me describe it well. Uh, alleged bribe, alleged dollar bribe, court stops Ganduje's probe. You are a lawyer, mm -hmm. so I'm just telling you as a lawyer, and I'm asking you things like this, when, why do they even happen? When a law is the prophecy of what the court will say, most times uh, we read these things in the paper, and begin to, and then we become judgmental. You begin to condemn the people and all that. When the fact of the story, you don't even know. The truth of the matter is the court does not uh, uh, base its decision on speculation, on uh, what is uh, published in the newspapers and what have you, and then on, on suspicious or some of these videos that uh, could be produced or that could be made uh, using artificial uh, intelligence and some other method to produce this uh, video. You must present concrete facts, evidence, uh, documentary, and what have you to the court to be able to sway the court to get whatever judgment, whatever decision, and then whatever solution, I mean, um, a resolution you want the court to be able to do. I am sure that the court will not have stopped uh, uh, the proof without some uh, facts, without some evidence being made available to it. But we must not uh, just uh, jump to conclusion. 
if one court has stopped this probe, there's always the opportunity for either the EFCC, the ICPC, or for the special fraud unit in the Nigerian police to appeal whatever decision has been made at the lower court or the high court to the Court of Appeal and to the Supreme Court. Look at the case of uh, the former... Let me just ask you, because we're running out of time. Let me just ask you... We're, we're running out of time. Let me just ask you this. What is okay. the rationale behind uh, stopping a probe when you can just uh, discharge and acquit that person and say he didn't do any wrong after everything? This is a probe. We are finding out whether you did it or you, you didn't do it, and you're just stopping it. So why not let it get to the point where this person will be pronounced not guilty? That's my, you know, my problem. You know, when you are also doing a probe, there are steps that you have to follow. You don't just begin to do a probe uh, for probing sake. If in the process of doing a probe you have violated the fundamental rights of the person you are probing, of course the court will hold the probe. i give you an example. Look at what happened in the incumbent government in those states and all that. I'm sorry to say, from people who appear to me to be in a hurry to take over from Makere Dolu and then the petition or stop the, the, the then deputy governor becoming from the governor, wanted to quickly organize a, a, an impeachment proceeding against the, 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 the governor yet that one another. And then I think they approached the court too. They approached the chief judge of, of the state to consult a panel and another. But the chief judge, I think, refused to do it. And then the man also went to the court and then um, and stop the move to impeach the, 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 the deputy governor, then who is not the governor. Why the court did that is that the court was able to leave him between the line that this is about politics. It's not about the, that the man has committed any infraction. It's that people want to step in and want to stop the man from becoming the governor. Or they themselves are, want to be the governor, and that's why they So, in the case of Gandhi, the fact that he's not our disposal, it is not impossible that all the requirements, all the steps, that those who are probing against Gambia should take. They have refused to take them. That is why the court is uh, stopping them uh, the probe. Because if you violate the fundamental rights of the citizen in the process of trying to probe him because you want to bring him to justice at all costs, of course the court will not find for you. Okay. That's all the patient. Uh, all right. Uh, well, to this. <laughs> okay. Let's be patient. That's a good way to uh, wrap it up this morning on Off the Press. We'd like to thank you, Mr. Kola Ole, for coming and sharing your thoughts on the program today. Thanks for having me. Good mm. bless and have a lovely day. You yeah. too. It's been a lot sunning in Lagos. I wouldn't know what the response is. Lagos has become very hot in the last few days. <laughs> it's everywhere. It's everywhere. Okay, we've been talking with Mr. Tunde Kolawole, a legal practitioner here in Lagos State. We were looking at the headlines. We'll take a short break, and when we return, we'll be looking at our hot topic, which focuses on women. Stay with us. <laughs>